and we do appreciate this is uh, again another uh, sensational group uh, our part three of a three-part series that we've done on, on college athletics and just to recap, you know, over the first two uh, panels, we've had some, some amazing panelists. Uh, Dr. Mark Nemec, president of Fairfield University, Richard Berman, former president of Manhattan, now down at uh, South Florida, Andy Fellingham, uh, consultant to uh, college athletic departments, Nick Kumar, who's the chief revenue officer for Columbia uh, University with JMI Sports, uh, Dr. Mark Reed, the president of St. Joseph's University, Dan Coonan, commissioner of ECAC, Marilyn McNeil, the Vice President and Director of Athletics at Monmouth University, and Jeff Orleans, the former Ivy League um, or Ivy Group um, Commissioner. Um, they've been tremendous. We appreciate so much information. All that stuff has been archived. We have it on several uh, platforms. So if you need to or want to go back and, 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 and view those panels, which people should if they haven't attended them, um, we do have those. We are excited about another great group here today. We're gonna to be talking about the jobs in the industry. Um, we have Joan McDermott, the, the University of San Francisco, Peter Roby, AD Emeritus, Emeritus of Northeastern and the former head of the, of the Center of Sport and Society. Uh, many of you may remember Richard Lapchick in that group. Um, Daniel Parker, President of Parker Executive Search and Miguel Zarita, the uh, Senior Director of Talent is, uh, for Spectrum Charter, former head of uh, HR for NBC Sports. That's when he uh, had done some work with us a couple of times at Manhattan College, where I run a master's program, and and Chelsea Piers here in Stanford. So um, we will uh, reiterate, uh, as we have the first two times, our 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 belief about uh, the Black Lives Matter and how important that is, and 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 we will be doing a panel or maybe a series of panels coming up with some former college and professional athletes, and we're going to have a frank discussion. Uh, I don't expect to solve world issues, but I do think it's worth having the communication. And so we're setting that up now, and we'll, we'll send out more information on that as soon as we have it. So hopefully you enjoy this panel. We Again, I thank them all for their time, and I thank Gene Doris, who is my dear friend, uh, helping me with this. And obviously, uh, he's moderated all three. He's very good at it. So if anybody out there wants to hire him, I, I, I highly recommend him. <laughs> Uh, he's the former uh, athletic director at Fairfield University, a knack to Hall of Famer, and once again, a, a dear friend and a true asset to to me and to this group. So, Gene, with that, you're on, buddy. Thanks, Dave. Dave is very kind. Um, I think my world has become Zoom these days uh, as, as we move forward in the new normal. Um, as we start to enter the new normal and obviously things are starting to open up and, and I think everybody in the sports collegiate world are dealing with making budgetary decisions and not the least of those budget, budgetary challenges involves personnel. Uh, if you take a look at a lot of budgets at colleges and universities, a lot of it revolves around personnel decisions, a lot of it revolves around benefits packages and things of that nature. And I don't think it's lost on anybody that um, both private and public institutions are facing a lot of uncertainty as far as enrollments are concerned in the fall. And privates in particular are very heavily dependent, or as we used to say in the profession, tuition driven mm -hmm. in terms of, of, of what their outlook financially is gonna be. Uh, obviously in the spring last year, um, the loss of the conference tournament and NCAA tournament in, in, in basketball uh, created uh, a little bit of a cutback in the revenue streams going to uh, individual colleges and all levels, Division One, Two, II, and Three, who all benefited from the Division One tournament financially. Um, so many schools, before we've gone into this kind of extended pause, uh, were seeing some financial difficulties. You've had some private institutions that have that have decided to shut their doors already. Without even, without even continuing to do things and find homes for their students elsewhere. Um, in addition to that, if you take a look at the demographics going forward, the applicant pool for college age applicants is dwindling over the next five years or so. And so that already was on the radar screen at, at most colleges and universities. But um, you know, with COVID and everything else, the elephant in the room has grown. And, uh, and, and, and gotten older quicker. So 
um, you had a New York Times article, and you know, some institutions have decided to cut sports. Uh, we've seen arguments on both sides as to whether or not that's a good thing to do or not. And besides limiting student athlete opportunities, it's also created a situation where there's a loss of jobs as a result of that. Every sport that gets cut has at least one coach that is now looking for new employment, if not two or three, depending on the sport. So, you know, you've got, uh, you've got that aspect. You've had colleges and institutions furloughing individuals uh, in order to help meet the budget shortfalls that they see ahead. Um, Division two, University of Bridgeport, which is right in my neighborhood, uh, basically decided to furlough everybody beginning in April, and uh, that's going till August 2nd at the, if that's if they bring back sports at all, you know, at this particular point. Um, and so you have the ongoing fears among a lot of people that, you know, and, and they're not in the room making these decisions. You know, but their lives are being affected from a personnel standpoint as to whether or not they're going to have jobs. And then you have other issues um, that will come out during the course of our discussion today uh, that deal with the fact of what are, what are the skill sets going to be necessary to meet the needs of the student athletes and the community in the new normal. Um, it, it, it's pretty obvious that you're starting to see a lot of people deciding to retire, a lot of people under fire. Uh, things along that line uh, for things that have been brewing or percolating under the radar screen for quite a few years now. So, um, and, and on the sports front of schools that have dropped sports, Brown University, you know, obviously made a decision which they thought was uh, going to bring excellence in athletics. And they have wound up with um, the president having to make a public apology for dropping men's and women's track. And they got Jeff Kessler, who's now representing women swimming and bringing a lawsuit against that mm -hmm. institution for, for that particular dropping of a sport. So, uh, you know, I think other people uh, are still continuing to do it. Was it lost on me that the University of Connecticut, with all of that still going on, dropped four sports yesterday in order to meet revenue uh, and, 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 and cut costs? Um, so again, with all of these things happening, uh, people are kind of being left out in the cold, not the least of which are people that are working in those, uh, jobs right now. So, uh, with all of these decisions, uh, the hope is that today we can have a discussion with regard to personnel issues and start to take a look at what the, what the job future looks like for people and things that they would have to do. And, uh, we're going to look at it from very different perspectives. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and, and give a brief intro on each of the panelists and then have them uh, make some opening remarks. And then we'll go around with some questions for the whole panel um, that uh, are pertinent to, um, to, to really everyone and, and, and let them give their perspectives on that. So Joe McDermott at uh, University of San Francisco for a second time around. And um, in addition to that, I've been a student athlete there, uh, former coach. Uh, and, uh, you know, she got that job on, on March 1st, and I think uh, of last year, and probably little did she know uh, that this would be the way she would be conducting business at the present time. Uh, she, had, yep, she had been the deputy athletic director, had served as the director of athletics at uh, Cal State East Bay, uh, long term uh, at uh, Metro out in the Midwest, and uh, was a driving force behind a lot of the success at all of the places that she's been. Um, you know, basically she's, she's a Hall of Famer uh, before she ever decides to retire, and I hope that's not anytime soon. So she's a leader in college sports, former vice chair of the NCAA Division II Management Council, uh, chair of the NCAA Division II Championships Committee, uh, part of the NACTA, uh, Under Armour Athletic Director of the Year in Division II. Um, awards that just go off the chart. Uh, so with that, I'm going to let uh, Joe make some opening comments as she's looking at the new normal and, 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 and how that's going to affect her from a personnel or how it's already affected her from a personnel situation. Sure. Jean, thank you for having me here today. You know, it definitely is the new normal um, and I feel ready to take it on. 
you know, uh, I feel like my experience, my vast experience is really helping me through this time. And back when I was first a coach, you know, you played who you can, you know, in your regional area. And ironically, I feel like we're all going back to that these days, you know, as a way to um, have some budget savings. But, you know, I think for me in this business uh, and where we are right now, I need to be the steady force for our department. I need to be the steady force in terms of having the right messages to our staff, our coaches, they're looking to me. And that's incredibly important. And I would emphasize the same thing for coaches, senior leadership, anyone in the athletic department these days. You know, um, just personally, and as I look to our staff, you need to be collaborative, flexible, nimble. As we know, it's not only changing by the day, sometimes it's changing by the hour. You know, having been in this business quite a while, I go back to probably one of the toughest days in my whole career was March 12th. And um, that was the day, you know, everything really started to hit the fan, you know, with the NCAA tournament um, being canceled. You know, we had already been through our basketball tournament, thankfully, but that day, you know, teams were told at halftime, all right, we're done, you know, go home. I had to, we had um, our baseball team on a charter bus heading to Southern California for their opening conference series. They're out in the middle of nowhere in California, you know, and um, I had to try and get a hold of them on their cell phones to stay, say, guys, guess what? Everything's canceled. You need to turn around and come back home. It was heartbreaking. You know, we had 12 seniors on that team you know, just heartbreaking for them. And then, of course, I, as you move forward, how do you manage that in terms of giving those kids an opportunity to come back if they want? So, you know, and from a budget standpoint. So it's all those skills that I think are critically important. They always have been, I think, in athletic administration in college athletics, but um, even more so now. Just a, a quick question from your perspective, how has the budget crisis that is hitting colleges affecting University of San Francisco and particularly sure. athletics and have you had to do furloughs? Where, sure. where, where? So first of all, early on, you know, we really tried to set some priorities. What was most important from a budget standpoint? Obviously we knew, you know, the, revenues were gonna go down. So the most important piece for us was people, student athletes, saving jobs, making sure our student athletes still had the opportunities that they deserved. We did, so we put a great plan together. We still have it. I talked to every head coach about it. They said, look, we're willing to do whatever. I don't wanna lose our assistant coaches. I wanna make sure, you know, we have the opportunities for our student athletes. So we put a great plan together, but at the end of the day, we did have to do some furloughs. And it, I think it was more, um, well, it was for the whole university. And athletics being a very visible program on campus, everyone was looking to us, well, what are you gonna do? You guys need to jump in and be a part of this. So we did furlough some individuals for June, for June, some more continuing through July, but the intent is everyone will be back. And as we made those decisions, what I tried to do is look at what, what was their job, what is their job responsibility? Did they really need, were they doing that job in June and July? Or could we have that time, you know, were those jobs that really maybe were not um, that important right at that minute? you know, ticket managers, um, equipment managers, you know, different places. So, but we, we have made sure each of those individuals are okay. I've reached out and talked to each one of those individuals and continue to do so because they're extremely important to our department. But those are not easy decisions, as you know, Gene. Yep. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Peter Roby. Uh, former director of athletics and recreation at Northeastern University, and as Dave mentioned, uh, had headed up the Center for Sport and Society. Uh, he's worked in the outside business world, uh, 
in kind of the the money part of the world uh, for a while with uh, with one of the shoe companies, Reebok. Um, I made but, money while I was an AD too, Gene. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't working for free back then either. <laughs> I could have called you. I didn't figure that part out myself. But, uh, but, but anyway, uh, been a Division One head basketball coach at Harvard University. Um, very heavily involved right now with the NCAA Pathway Program, which is an outstanding program, which I'm not sure a lot of people really know about, but I'm sure Peter will give us some insight. Uh, give us some insight on how he sees the job market with diversity in sport. Obviously, has having been part of the Center for Sport and Society, was looking at report cards back in the day uh, of how people were, were doing things, and now he's an integral part of the Knight Commission in terms of trying to help decision-making going forward. And uh, I want to let Peter talk, so I'm going to turn it over to him right now, my good friend, Peter Rowe. Thanks, Gene. Always great being with you, and thank you so much for the invitation. Dave, thank you for your invitation. Uh, really, um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, especially with, with the other um, panelists who have accomplished so much in their career. So I'm happy to be here, and hopefully we'll, we'll have some things to say that will help those that are on um, the webinar today. So, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's a seminal moment in uh, the history of college athletics. Um, I don't think that's overstating it. Um, you know, uh, the COVID uh, situation um, would have made this uh, a fairly seminal moment in and of itself, uh, mm -hmm. because I think everybody uh, will agree that uh, we're, uh, higher education is not going to be the same coming out of COVID than it was going in. As you already alluded to in your opening comments, Gene, um, institutions were already struggling to figure out how they were going to sustain themselves and what kind of model they were going to create uh, to create value going forward to make sure that this um, next generation of, of college age students uh, were gonna get the value proposition that their parents and they wanted with respect to creating a career uh, coming out of college uh, and what they could study given the, 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 the economy and, and what the economy is looking for in terms of job skill. So, um, you know, as we know, plenty of um, smaller liberal arts schools were um, struggling to figure out what their mission was gonna be going forward, how they could justify significant tuition and room and board costs. Um, and, and now on top of all of that, you have COVID that has um, completely um, shut the economy down. And so all the tax revenue that would have accrued uh, from all that um, commerce that states would have relied on uh, to um, allocate and distribute to their state institutions um, you know, have dwindled to a, uh, to a screeching halt. Uh, so now not only do the liberal arts schools have an issue that they had going in, um, but now they have to figure out how they're going to do hybrid and all that and, and what they're going to charge and where's the margin coming from because most of the margin in um, tuition driven institutions was coming from room and board uh, not, and not from what they were doing in the classroom. Uh, so you, on top of that now, uh, uh, lay NIL on top of that. So, <laughs> right. So COVID was already going to create a, a, a tipping point in collegiate athletics and now lay on top of that NIL um, and nobody knows how that's going to play out. The NCAA task force and uh, committees are hard at work trying to figure it out. And, it, it, and while they're doing that, um, uh, state legislators and um, uh, federal legislators are putting tremendous pressure on the NCAA and its members uh, by passing their own state uh, um, laws around NIL. Uh, California dropped the bomb first, but their, their starting point was far enough in advance that everybody thought that they did that as a shot across the bow to get the NCAA's attention so they would take it seriously and pass legislation prior to the implementation of the, of the uh, state law. Uh, and then right on the heels of that, Florida uh, decides that we're not waiting uh, for anybody. Uh, so 2021, it's coming. And now the NCAA is trying to lo lobby Congress. Uh, the irony is that for many years, everybody wanted to keep the, the feds out of it. And now everybody's dying for the feds to get involved. Uh, because if the feds don't get involved and pass sweeping NIL legislation that um, standardizes what can be done and how it's going to be done, uh, you're going to have a hodgepodge of 
of, of 35, 40, 50 states uh, in terms of how that's all going to play out, what the student athletes' um, um, law or, uh, rights are in terms of uh, using their name, image, and likeness. Um, so on the, on the Knight Commission, we're looking at that very uh, significantly. We've had some statements that we've already made. We've put some principles out there that we hope that the NCAA will, will take seriously with respect to independent third-party uh, management of, of, uh, uh, of what those, those relationships might look like. Um, so that um, student athletes don't get taken advantage of, but also that um, those that are uh, uh, stakeholders of institutions don't um, uh, take advantage of the situation and try to gain an unfair recruiting advantage. So, man, it's, um, you know, COVID was bad enough. The, just the, the, the way the, the trends in higher education were going before COVID was creating uh, angst for everybody. Uh, and now, uh, on top of that, as you say, COVID and NIL, um, we will not see this kind of uh, conflagration of issues uh, hitting the NCA and hitting college athletics and hitting higher education. I don't think we'll see that maybe for another 50 years. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that I can be a part of whatever those dialogues are. Um, but it's crucial that we, we get it right um, so that we can sustain what I believe has been you know, a wonderful model for allowing young people to get a quality education and, and develop the skills and the, and the um, friendships uh, that'll last them a lifetime and let them go out and, and lead um, this country and, and the world going forward. So um, I don't mean to overstate it because I think it's that important. Peter, uh, talked a little bit the other day when we were going through our dry run about uh, your, your, your thoughts on diversity uh, going forward in the job market, in the new normal, and skill sets, and a little bit about the pathway program as to how that fits in. Could you make some comment on that and just give us your thoughts? Sure. Well, um, you know, last month in particular has been uh, really sad, uh, frustrating. Uh, it makes us angry. People in the black community have been living this reality uh, in some cases for 400 years, uh, and our voices have gone uh, unheeded in certain um, parts of, of our um, society. Um, we've made progress, there's no question about that. And, and I'm proud of the progress that's been made. Uh, but as um, the incidents indicate, um, we've got a long way to go in terms of um, um, social justice reform, um, uh, law enforcement, uh, training, um, uh, uh, anti anti uh, racism uh, and equality, and so I've tried to be a part of the solution for a long time. If I was going to complain, I had to be part of the solution. So I've been involved with the NCA and its leadership development uh, department for well over a decade, trying to lend my support and my time uh, and whatever experience I can bring to uh, aspiring athletic directors. Uh, coaches that want to get better, or assistant coaches that hope to be head coaches, and student athletes who want to be leaders, who, who are looking for advice and counsel and uh, mentors. And so I've, I've made that my life's work, really. And um, the, the issues of the last month just heightened the importance of all of that work because, you know, I've tried to, um, I've, I've tried to be a part of the pathway program that was established many years ago under the name of the um, fellows program um, that was um, implemented because the NCA and its membership had realized that there was a, a real need for women and ethnic minorities in positions of leadership within the NCA structure and in particular athletic directors. And um, it's been rebranded the, the pathway program over the last uh, eight or nine years or so. Uh, but the mission is still the same, and we've broadened it to include white males, uh, which I think is a good thing because uh, now we can create allies and uh, raise awareness around the issues of um, of equity, uh, Title IX, diversity, and inclusion uh, with all segments of the membership. And, um, you know, uh, we have to fill the pipeline with quality people so that we take the excuse away that there's not enough people out there that are qualified to be in those positions. Uh, we know that that's BS. Uh, and we hope that presidents uh, and chancellors 
and um, boards of trustees will um, take it upon themselves uh, to be fair with respect to how they um, evaluate uh, candidates, make sure that they commit themselves to creating a, a diverse pool. And Daniel can talk about that from his standpoint in, in search um, and how, how crucial it is uh, that, that you uh, broaden your network, make sure you have people that are uh, from the black community, from the Latinx community, who know who these qualified people are that can um, uh, benefit the search and um, provide opportunities for people to lead that are uh, uh, from underrepresented um, communities. So I'm committed to it. I've been committed to it for a long time. And um, you know, I hope that um, others see the need for it uh, as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, turn to Dan, Daniel Parker. Um, as I've told him before, and I'm not blowing smoke at him, uh, basically, I think uh, Parker Search is really kind of the gold standard uh, in, in the business of the search firms. And that I'm not giving an SBI endorsement to anybody at this point. It's just a personal feeling on this of having, having seen what he's been able to do over the years. And it's, and it's been more than just doing searches. I mean, he's gotten involved with training programs at Villa 7 with Nike to try to give. And I, and I saw it personally being part of Villa 7 of when we first started uh, with doing um, the kind of mini interviews with assistant coaches who were on the radar screen to move ahead. They weren't really good at interview skills and, 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 and things along that line because nobody had ever worked with them. And then Daniel comes in and within a couple of years of him working with those folks, um, all of a sudden, you know, now we're doing these many interviews and, and they're, they're like shining stars. And that I think is directly attributable uh, to Daniel getting involved and giving his time and effort to, uh, to try to help people learn how to interview when it comes down to it and to, and to help the diversity in the marketplace. Uh, so Daniel's been involved with doing searches at, uh, at Parker Executive Search for a long time. Uh, he's basically uh, got, a, got a great deal of experience at uh, doing searches at, at higher level administrative positions at colleges and universities, athletic directors, coaches, um, Certainly, um, when you take a look at it, uh, the pause has certainly changed a little bit of the, the way he's had to do business, but uh, probably he'll agree that the principles of what he's done, uh, you know, don't change. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel to, to do the talking and kind of give us an idea of how he feels search firms can do, can do a good job with jobs in it kind of get a forecast from him as to how he sees the, the search process going forward in, in, the, in the new normal. Well, thanks, Gene. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with these, uh, these Hall of Famers. It's always uh, tough to go after Peter, Peter Roby on a uh, panel. Uh, I, I'll say, I'll start off, uh, two of my harder searches I ever had to complete was uh, uh, Denver Metro and Northeastern, trying to follow Joan and uh, Peter and uh, I heard about how great they were for days and days when I was on campus. So it's, it's a pleasure to be, uh, be with this group. And uh, Gene, known you for a long time. And uh, uh, you may have to go around with me from now on and do all these panels so you can introduce me. Like that. I really appreciate it. But, uh, yeah, times have certainly changed. I think, I think Peter's right. Uh, we're not going back to the so-called normal anytime soon. I mean, we've been seeing, uh, you know, with our firm, we work – everywhere on campus, recruiting leaders, presidents and provosts, down to coaches and administrators and, and conference commissioners and everywhere in between. I just came from a Zoom uh, working on a women's head hockey coach at, at RIT. So we're, we're doing a lot of Zooms nowadays by interviews, which we used to we'd fly 10 or so candidates into an airport round of interview. And now we can do it more quickly and, and effectively. And there's a lot of good things that are coming out of this as well. And, and I think uh, to what Peter's talking about now, uh, where the job market is headed, uh, there's a lot more emphasis on, on student athlete welfare now and mental health. And we've been hearing these topics uh, for years, you know, diversity inclusion officers, and, and some institutions give lip service to men, mental health or diversity and inclusion. And I think now, you know, we're going to pay real attention and not just us. We, we have for a long time, but I think institutions are going to be forced to not just put a vice president over a diversity and inclusion or over mental health, but really have a set structure and do away with some of these old tendencies and practices that we had uh, because the, the old way of doing business is not coming back anytime soon. We, we've been affected as a company. We had layoffs 
uh, with our small business, the search industry. You know, we've seen this in, in the past. I look to my mentors and talk about, you know, past times. In 2001, uh, there was a real crisis. In 08, 09, we had an economic crisis. Uh, now we're going through, you know, a social, economic. There, there's so many moving parts. Every, every day and every week, it, it feels like it changes. Uh, you know, mental health, some days even my own mental health, I have to think about, Gene that uh, I'm so positive and then things will happen. And, and I'll say maybe, you know, we're not headed in the right direction as a country or in college athletics. So I think having mentors, having friends in this business, this is such a, a close connected group. Uh, I hated not being an actor this summer in a lot of the conventions where I see a lot of my friends and colleagues. So uh, it certainly is evolving, is changing. I think it's so important that we, we continue to have conversations. We have open dialogue. Uh, about what's going on. NIL is going to change. It's a game changer. It's going to change uh, the way uh, college athletics looks now and into the future. But we've been having some of those conversations for a long time, and now we're starting to see uh, we're putting, uh, putting things in, into action. So, you know, we're, we're going to talk later. You're going to ask me questions about where I see positions changing. I think it is evolving, and the market is continuing to move. I think it's so important that as administrators you continue – uh, to deal with these crises, you continue to get experience because at the end of the day, what our clients always want is they want proven experience, whether it's crisis management or it's in dealing with people and hiring and firing. And, and we know, as Joan was talking about, these are tough decisions. These are really, really hard decisions. We had to do it here, but I think that's as leaders, you know, that's what we have to do. And we have to manage into crises and, and certainly out of crises. And these times will get better. They're, they're, they're going to get better like they did in 01, like they did in 08, 09. Some of our best years were in 2011, 12, 13, after those, those really dark years in 08 and 09. So I tell everybody on this call, stay positive. we got to get through this together uh, because we are better as a group. Thank you. Um, now to uh, Miguel Zarita, who's an experienced – human resource person. He's been a global talent and acquisition executive for over 30 years. Uh, he's been with everybody, Disney, ESPN Media, NBC Sports, Universal, and now uh, with Charter Spectrum. Has a proven record of uh, managing effective recruitment, selection of diverse, high quality, experienced candidates and, and creating good candidate pools. Um, he's got good leadership and management skills and uh, you know, has, is, 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 is a person who's made it from the bottom up when it comes down to it. So he's been there, done that. Um, and now, you know, he's obviously uh, looking at new ways that, you know, businesses have to operate. Uh, and, you know, sports businesses are a part of that. Uh, one of the questions I would ask him to lead off a little bit is from an HR perspective, um, when you're an athletic administrator and you get told that you have to do a headcount exercise, what should that administrator think of that and what does that actually mean and what is the best way to do that? Good question. I'm just kidding. Uh, thank you for the invite. I'm honored to be here. I'm sort of, uh, I think I feel like the, the rookie with this distinguished panel of professionals, they're all have great backgrounds and uh, I appreciate being part of it. Um, hope to uh, make a little bit of a contribution in uh, the panel here with uh, providing uh, constructive ideas and ways to uh, meet the new challenges that we have uh, in today's uh, economy and employment world with this crisis that we have. With regards to your question, you know, it's, I, I think it's a question, it's a good question because Everyone is looking at that from one angle or another. Uh, and I think that the first thing that you need to look at is, you know, what is going to be your near future work environment? Are you going to have your team with you? Are you going to have your team working remotely? Uh, what are going to be the pieces that is going to uh, take place? And then you do the uh, skills assessment. Basically, you look at your team and you look at the folks that you have what their skills are, what they're responsible for, uh, what are the things that they're good at, and what are the things that they could do better, and who's gonna work best in a remote type of work environment, who is going to excel. 
uh, I think that a lot of folks says it's great to work from home, but there's a, there's a very strong expectation that comes with that. That means that you have to work on a team and have collaboration, but yet work for yourself. And, and that requires a different skill set that unfortunately not everyone has. There are folks that are great when they're in the office and working in a team, but and there are the folks that do excel when they're working remotely. So uh, going back to your question, I think that that administrator is going to say, okay, wh what do I have to work with? Um, who am I going? Do I have the right people in the right places? And if not, make that switch and, you know, reassess and reallocate uh, headcount and reallocate resources where you're going to be the most effective to deliver the results that the team is expected to do. Uh, and then look at those folks that may not be a good fit and, and see if you can find another place within your team or within the organization. Um, everyone is trying very hard to do a good job, uh, but I think that um, the, the market and the, the scenario is changing and uh, some people that are really good at doing one thing in a specific environment, they can no longer do that because you don't have that. So look at that, look at the assessment skills, look at the folks and try to keep everyone busy and working uh, but make sure that they have the tools and resources to be successful at it. Thank you, Miguel. Um, for the whole panel, what, how has the pause really made you look at the skill sets that you're looking at for jobs that you may not have taken the time to really think them out because uh, you didn't have the pause before? What, what do you think are the skill sets that are going to make it in the new normal? Um, Daniel, what, what are you looking at maybe differently or what are you telling colleges and, and universities that they should look at when, when you're looking at them deciding the skill sets they're going to need? Well, I think a lot of the same fundamentals are still the same, but if you're asking specific about maybe COVID and the current events, uh, first thing I start thinking about is, is event management skills or, or equipment. Uh, you know, how are we going to get these games back uh, safely and effectively? I think about facilities going forward. Uh, are the way we build facilities going to look different? Uh, are we going to have, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot more strategic thought and thinking going into facility management and how we get 100,000 people in and out of a stadium that before, I don't think we ever thought about it. We would just cram everybody in and rush them in a, a, an entry point, an exit point. So I, I think, you know, strategic thinking and evaluation, budget management, you know, have always been critical, but even more now going forward, you know, into our new normal. So I mentioned before the, the student athlete welfare piece. Uh, we've been talking about that for years and years, but Really, how are we taking care of these young people from, from a mental health, physical health? You know, how are we getting them back on campus safely and effectively? Because at the end of the day, if we don't have students on campus, we don't have college athletics and we don't have universities. So I think it all starts at, at that point is how do we effectively get young people transitioned back to campuses? How do we have facilities? How do we have equipment that's safe, that we're in an environment where everybody feels protected and safe and we can carry on? and have college athletics again. So uh, that's a few things that I think of, uh, you know, quickly about how the world has changed in, in the last few months. From a coach's perspective, what do you think you're gonna be looking for in coach searches uh, that would be helpful to people out in the audience that are either looking to move up to a higher level in, in, in coaching or move from an assistant coach to a head coach? What are the skill sets that you think are necessary for them to show at this point? going forward well I, I think that hasn't changed a lot i think a uh, history of, of taking care of young people and recruiting the the best brightest uh athletes i, I think they've got to you know be real community builders uh, i think coaches need to embrace being on college campuses you don't live in a work in a silo you're not just the basketball coach you're a, you're an important member on campus i think uh, young up-and-coming coaches need to reach across the aisle and go see their president, their provost and their deans and get to know folks on campus, but also, you know, in the community, get to know their alums. I think those are important skills that athletic directors and presidents want to see in their coaches that, 
they're more than just coaches. Yes, you've got to be great X's and O's. You've got to be great recruiters. You've got to be great culture builders and program builders. Uh, but we don't do this in a silo. We're part of a college campus, and, and we're doing it with people. We need to bring people to the table and make sure we're part of the community. If you just want to coach ball and you want to go to the pros, that's you know you can certainly do that, and that's different. But if we're talking just college sports, you know I think it's important for for young college coaches to remember that you know you are doing this, and there, there's a greater good of educating and. It's not four years, it's 40 years for, for these young folks. And, and remembering that and keeping that in mind, I think that's what our clients are looking for in coaches, bigger than just the, the X's and O's piece. Yeah, the other day you mentioned uh, the ability of a candidate to show results, that they can actually show results. How, how, do, how, do, how does a candidate actually show you that they've had results besides wins and losses? Well, in the interview, you got to give dedicated examples of, of experiences, not just the theories and philosophies, not just what do you think about diversity and inclusion. Tell me what you've actually done to promote minorities on your staff or in, in other opportunities, whether it's operations or marketing or ticketing or, or what it's been. So, you know, I think that uh, hiring managers want dedicated results. If, it, if it's a, talking about revenue generation, don't just tell me revenue generation is important. Show me what you've actually done uh, in your past. Student athlete welfare. Give me some examples. Be creative. I think that's an opportunity uh, for you to differentiate yourself from those that you're going to be going against by talking about examples of what you've actually done versus what your thoughts and philosophies are. Okay. Peter, you, you know, you've been at all levels. You've been coach, administrator, student athlete. What do you think is going to be the skill set that you see? You know, how do you, how do you feel about that going forward? Well, um, you, you, you're going to have to be nimble and flexible. Um, you, can't get, you can't be rigid uh, in these roles anymore because the world is ever-changing. So um, there's, uh, there's forces and stakeholders and circumstances that are um, bringing themselves to bear on the experience that, um, we have in college athletics and in leadership and administrative uh, responsibilities in the student athlete experience. Um, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a, 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 an ability to communicate uh, empathetically um, in order to contextualize the work or contextualize the decision making that you have to make as a leader, uh, you're going to lose some of your people. You're going to lose really good staff. You're going to lose student athletes, you're going to really alienate parents because you can't, you can't contextualize the decision making. You can't um, put it into a context that they can understand uh, and play it out uh, in terms of what it means uh, down the road. So uh, you better be an effective communicator. Uh, you better be a good listener uh, because the student athletes um, the, the days of the student athletes sitting on the sideline and letting the coaches and others just tell them what to do, those days are long gone. And, and hallelujah. Uh, our job uh, should have always been, as educators that happen to use sports to educate, was that we were helping young people find their voice, to build their confidence, to teach them how to advocate for themselves, um, to not be afraid to speak truth to power, do it in a respectful way, hold themselves and others accountable. So um, you, you really, um, I hope, uh, better be um, seeing yourself as an educator first, that you're, you're prepared to lead by example, uh, that you're going to be consistent with what you say and what you do, uh, that you have empathy for, for young people, uh, and that you're, um, you're committed to developing your staff. Uh, because I think you're going to end up having to have, you're going to have to do the same job uh, under tougher conditions with less people. And if you can't find a way to invigorate and inspire your staff and find the people that can do more than one thing and do it with real energy and passion and, and commitment, uh, it, the, these jobs are going to be harder. So um, you're going to have to do more as an athletic director. Head coaches are going to have to be willing to do more. They're going to have to be more of a representative of the institution, as Daniel said. Uh, you're going to have to take a more global view. You're going to have to know what the budget situation is for your institution. You're going to know what that piece is that's athletics. You're going to need to know that you're not just doing this, as Daniel said, in a silo, but it's all part of a community. And enrollment management and financial aid and um, 
you know, the, the personnel issues. Um, that's all going to be stuff that you should know so that you can contextualize it. Because parents and students, when you go into their home, they're going to ask you about those issues. What's, this, what's the future of the institution? What's the future of the athletics department? Are, are there going to be sports that are going to be cut? Are, are you going to have to lose coaches? Are we going to still get the same sort of coaching and uh, preparation to be the best player, uh, best athlete and student that we can be? Um, and you, so, you again, you better be able to communicate it in the context of what's going on in your institution, what's going on in your state, and what's going on nationally. Thank you, Peter. Joan, um, you, you mentioned the other day about as you, as you try to bring and, and save jobs and things along that line, and you've obviously got a great deal of experience of having worked at the Division II level where resources maybe weren't the same as at the Division I level, and, and, and knowing how to deal with, with, with smaller budgets. You talked about saving jobs and you talked about working across campus to do that. Can you, you know, kind of put that, that out there? I thought that was a very good point you made the other day when we were having our pre-discussion. Yes, for sure. It kind of goes, ties into what Miguel, I think, had said earlier, you know, um, and someone else had said it also. Gene, I think you did. You know, during this pause, looking at skill sets of your employees, how can you maybe potentially move things around? Can we, uh, for an event manager, not for game management, event manager, fundraising events, can we partner with advancement across campus and share that position? Are there, you know, different ways to do that? So as Peter and Daniel both said, I need to reach across campus as well and say, you know what, I know your budgets are tight, you have some positions open, what can we do together? to strengthen all of us with these skill sets. And the more us in athletics can be integrated across campus, the better. So we've done that. Also, you know, I've had head coaches step forward and say, in fact, our men's basketball coach stepped forward and said, you know, before I got into coaching, I was in sales, corporate sales for the conference office. If you need my help, you know, I'm happy to jump in and help you know, your people that are doing that. Um, we had another coach say, you know what, I've been involved in development. I'm happy to help there. So it's great to hear that collaboration, just like Peter was saying, it's more than just doing your job. You need to be nimble so you can pick up other skills, think about your strengths, think about what other people's strengths are. That's, so that's what we're trying to do. And it's, you know, in some ways it's a, great way to grow people you know peter talked about empathy you know they need to know you care whether you're a coach and that's your student athlete or whether you're the athletic director and it's your staff and coaches if they know you care by being empathetic by being authentic by building that trust you're going to Every, they're going to run through a wall for you. And, and they need to know you would do the same for them. So that, I we can't emphasize that enough. And I think we've all said it in different ways here. That is, you know, it, and then it's about developing everyone and on the staff, on the coaches. Yes, we want to help our assistant coaches move up. <laughs> when you're looking at uh, diversity, can we grow our own within the department? You know, do we have some younger people on the staff that have a great skill set that they haven't been able to use yet? And, you know, what can we do to help develop them? And, you know, they hear that from you, the athletic director. Oh, my gosh, they love that. You know, okay, what can I do to learn that and be involved? Um, and I think where I am in my career, kind of what Peter said, to me, it's about mentoring these young people. Um, I do it all the time. I just got a text message uh, from an individual who's in the middle of a coaching search, and she said, I've had three Zoom interviews. They're going to make a decision by the weekend. You know, so I think, you know, when we talk about it's going to look different, yes, you're going to have to get your point across, and people need to learn who you are through Zoom meetings. You know, can you be real? Can you really express yourself? It's one thing to do it in person, face to face, you know, but you have to get used to this type of environment. And it's kind of a, 
that's an exciting part of this is being able to do that. The last piece I would say is some of our staff, they seem to think, well, come August 1st, we're going to be back to normal. We're all going to be back in our offices. We'll be, you know, I'll have my staff in my office and this and that. Well, it's not going to quite look that way. So you need to continue to look at virtual meetings. You know, can you do a, a watch film? you know, and break film down with your student athletes over Zoom. Yes, you can. That That's in the system to be able to make that work, as I'm sure it's in other software systems. So, you know, those are great things and people need to embrace it, you know, embrace these things. And, and Daniel, you had talked about earlier, 2001 and 2008, nine. Man, I remember it, Metro State, those were tough times. You know, I think you have to be able to sell your athletic program where we are an investment for the university. We're not a subsidy. You know, we are an investment for the whole university. What can we do to assist? We're the front porch. We're the window to the university. How can we help the mission in many ways? And having head coaches be involved in those pieces, critical. Thank you, Joan. Miguel, you have uh, talked, to, you know, your title is Global Acquisition of Talent. How, is, how are you looking going forward in the job market as, is it going to be more difficult? Is it, gonna, is it easier? What, what, what are you looking at right now? Um, I, I, I think it's, it's uh, more challenging, okay? I don't like to think of things being difficult, I like things being challenging. Um, I think there's a whole new set of skills that both people looking for jobs as well as in, uh, people hiring managers need to learn. And that's to be able to interview, assess, and make a decision by looking at a video versus shaking hands. You know, some people says like, yeah, I took that person's hand. It's really good. I felt good about it. Okay. Well, you don't have that anymore. So how do you do that handshake and feel good about it through a video? Okay, so some folks have to learn. That's a new skill that people didn't have before. Um, some people are like, well, I don't want to take a job unless I literally was physically at the place that I'm going to be at so I can get a sense of it. Well, that may not be the situation anymore. Uh, you know, in, in our company, we're doing everything virtual from, from start to finish. Even the onboarding, sending you a computer home and sending you instructions what you need to do. So you may not see someone that works in your company until a month or two months into it, okay? So getting back to your question, what do I look for? Folks that are, have made a good adjustment into that, that they're going to be able to say, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not being physically there. I understand my job. I know my function. I know what I need to do. I know what I need to deliver. I know where to find the resources and tools that I need and get the job done. So I think that it's, 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 it's a little, it's a combination of that hard skill set and that soft skill being able to adjust well mm -hmm. to the new norm, to the new environment and, uh, and, and, and go from there. So the challenge now, you know, is to, to find people in the markets that are not doing so well. So, you know, do they have good transfer skills? Okay. So, like she was saying before, if this person did sales before once upon a time, can they do that? Is that skill transferable? And so look at not just at the specific, you know, it, the, 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 before searches were targeted, you know, you were really laser focused. That's what I'm looking for. And that's where I'm going to go to find that person. Now you really have to broaden that and find out what do they bring to the table besides that specific skill. And when that's challenging, uh, because uh, on top of everything else, uh, we do nation and global searches. Not a lot of people want to move these days. So they go, it's like, that's great that the job is in Denver, but I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I'll take the job, but I don't want to move. So how do you get over that hurdle? So it's a number of things that are a little more challenging and complicated, not difficult, uh, but definitely not easy. We're going to ask everybody for closing comments. And while you're on, Miguel, why don't we, why don't we let you make your closing comments? Sure. Um, so I, I think that the main thing that, that I, I say to everyone that's in, in my staff, as well as people that I know and that I collaborate with, is that 
you know, stay positive, okay? Things will get better. Uh, look at the, ha you know, the glass half full versus half empty. Uh, look at you, if you're, if you're in a industry that is, is in a, in a down mode, look at who's, who's, you know, who's, who's hiring, you know, what are they looking at? Uh, look at your, look at your functional areas. You know, if you, if you're a, uh, an event planner in athletics and in college or in, in sports, you know, what other, you know, that's a functional area. What other companies or industries are hiring for that same skill set? You can do that same job somewhere else. Um, so I think look at that, look at what skills you have, go to your toolbox and look at what transfer skills do you have that if I did this in this company, I could do it effectively and successfully somewhere else. So think positive, think that you've got good skill sets to, to offer to potential employers and go forward. Thank you, Miguel. Peter. Yeah, thanks, Gene, again, for, for having me. Um, uh, I guess what I would close on is um, uh, that uh, the, the, the institution that you work at continued to try to deliver um, quality educational opportunities to their students um, during the COVID um, crisis um, without um, athletics. And I think that's a, um, that's a wake-up call for anybody out there um, who, who thinks that um, athletics is, is crucial uh, to the enterprise. Uh, it is a big part of the community building and we certainly understand the importance of sport in our own development as former student athletes and, and, and as coaches uh, after that and as administrators. But I think it makes a, a powerful statement for all of us in terms of maintaining our humility when it comes to our involvement with collegiate athletics, that you know the institutions have continued to um, to try to uh, educate their their students without athletics. And so, when we start thinking how important we are, we better look back at this time and, and realize that we're not as essential as we thought we were. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe the demands that we make on our institutions should be uh, couched in the context of of what we're really there to do educate young people and make sure we help them develop. And um, so do we need, um, do we need uh, a, a practice facility? Uh, why do we need a practice facility? We need a practice facility because somebody else in the conference has a practice facility and you feel like you can't beat them unless you have a practice facility because you can't recruit the kid. Then maybe you're recruiting the wrong kid. If that's the only reason that they're coming to your place is because they want all the shiny stuff, then maybe that's not the person you want to put your faith and, and confidence in. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure on people in higher education these days. And um, we need to be uh, grateful for the opportunities that we're given. And maybe we take less money and maybe we don't have the big office and maybe we don't have all the, the bells and whistles and we can still go out and win games and develop young people and make sure they get a quality education. So I'll leave it at well, that. Well said, Peter. Thank you. Daniel. Daniel. Well, wait, Peter's been giving that speech for many years, not just because of what happened. That has been a consistent message, and I, and I love it. I, I would just say uh, stay connected with people, love people. You know, this too shall pass. Uh, we, we're all fortunate to, to be in the business that we're in. Uh, you know, we're grateful, thankful that uh, we get to do this. Uh, have, have great mentors, you know, like, like Joan, like Peter, like Miguel that, that are on here, like Gene. You know, folks that have been through battles in the past, I mean, that's really uh, saved me a lot of times when, when I've had tough days is reaching out to those that I, I really look up to and, and, and they've been through it and it gets me through it. So if I can ever help anybody, I'm easy to get a hold of, you know, my email and phone number and everything's on our website. Uh, so don't hesitate if it's a week from now or 10 years from now, you know, we, we plan to be doing this for a long time. So we're here to help and, and I wish everybody the best. Thank you, Daniel. Joan. Sure, taking um, off of what uh, Daniel just said, I'm always available as well. My email's on our website site. I'm happy to have conversations and assist people whenever needed and be a mentor. That's the best part of the job, quite honestly, is to help people grow. I would say right now, um, know that we will come through this. Yes, it's going to look different on the other side, but we're going to be okay, whatever that is. 
So as we're going through it, use this opportunity, lean into it, embrace it, and work on your own skills. You know, what are those and how can I become better? Being listening in on these webinars, there's a ton of them right now. And it's, for me, it's been great. You know, I, I love to hear what other people have to say, what their philosophy is, you know, because you can always learn. And so lean into it, embrace it, take it as an opportunity. Know we'll come through and we'll be that much stronger on the other side. Thank you, Joan. And I want to personally thank everybody on the panel. Give yourselves a hand. You were a great panel today and I think disseminated some great information to, uh, to everybody that was out there. And uh, luckily, we're going to be able to put it up on YouTube and all after two. So people that couldn't get on live will have the opportunity to see you guys later on too. And I'll throw that back to Dave then to, uh, to close this out. Right. Thank you, Gene. Yes, thanks, Gene. And thank you to this great group, uh, to Joan, Peter, Daniel and Miguel, uh, you guys are tremendous. Uh, there were a couple of questions I don't think Gene saw in the chat. Uh, I don't want to keep people any longer because we are over the time limit anyway, but, and I don't think it's fair. I'm going to send everybody these questions. Really, they're more for Peter, I think, and Joan, but I'll send them to everybody and with, this, uh, with Abigail's email so you can answer her questions. They're good questions, really dealing with NIL and sponsorship. So um, sure. I, would, I told her that I would okay. use so, so that's, uh, but again, thank you. And thank you to the previous panelists and, and previous weeks. It's, it's been a great series, I think. We are looking forward to our next series, which I mentioned at the beginning, is going to deal with race relations and sports, uh, college athletics. We do have some former college athletes and professional athletes who are going to be joining us. Uh, don't pin me to this, but these are the people who have indicated they're interested. Lowe's Moore, who's a dear friend, played one of the best basketball players to come out of West Virginia. And, and runs the uh, Girls and Boys Club in Mount Vernon. Uh, Lowe's is going to be the moderator, at least for the first one. Uh, he's asked Alan Houston to participate. Uh, Brian Jones, former NFL player, you may have seen him on CBS uh, talking about the current situation. Uh, Mark May, potentially. Uh, Kevin Hallinan, who's a former uh, vice president of Major League Baseball Security and a former FBI agent and New York City cop. So if you have any suggestions, if anybody has any thoughts on that, please feel free to, uh, to contact me. And uh, once again, thank you for the people who joined us, for the, the panelists, and again to Gene for doing a great job with this. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, thank Dave. You. Thanks, Gene. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. The same. Yep. Bye now. Bye now.